And I know that Jesus died for me. I know that Jesus died for me. That song about calling me out of the grave. It fits, it fits very well because before I met Christ, I was dead. Before I met Christ, I was dead. But he saw fit that he would leave the throne and he would come down here so that I, so that you, so that we, so that we would be alive. A lot of what we grow up with, a lot of what happens in, in, in the world, a lot of, of what we're used to, is really our norm. It's everything that we know. It's what we're used to. It's what we grew up seeing. And you don't realize, when you're amongst other dead people, you don't realize that you're dead. When everything is normal to you, when, like my norm was, was, was to hang out with other people that were dead, therefore I was in place because I was, I was with them. We were all dead. And you get to a point that you wake up, you realize that, hey, I was dead. So your worship is different once you understand that you are no longer dead. It has to be different. When you understand that you had certain death in front of you, and all of a sudden you have eternal life. All of a sudden you have what you didn't have before, so you could have missed it before because you didn't have it. You couldn't miss it because you didn't have it. That's what Jesus did for me. That's what Jesus did for me. And I thank him for that. Because the reality is that he didn't have to. When you really think about it, he didn't have to. Like Jesus was obligated. He did not have to. Yet God the Father, he formulated a plan. And when he formulated the plan, he included his son. And his son eventually came down because of our mistake. It, that, that hits you different. That hits you different when you understand how big that was. See, when you don't know you don't know. When you don't know, everything's okay. That's what we call ignorance, because you don't know. But once you know, once you understand that Jesus didn't have to, but God the Father said, I am going to send my son, the only one that I have, I'm going to send my son so that they won't perish. I tell you, my worship is different, man. And it doesn't mean that I don't mess up. It doesn't mean that I don't sin. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that I have grace. And it means that I try not to sin. It means that I try to walk upright. It means that I try to do the right things. We're going to get into the word. In our church, we have, we, have, we have gotten into the deep end. We have done what we believe we should have always done. What we believe we should have always been taught. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that we are better than anyone else. It means that we're standing on the word of God. That's all that means. We're standing on the... We, we chose... To stand on the word of God. We're going to get into this word. Before we go into the scripture. I want to build foundation. We're going into the book of James. And one thing that I know about the book of James is that. James isn't heavy on theology. But he is heavy on application. 
He isn't the one. He's not Paul. Right? But he's very heavy on application. And you need both. You need to know what to do, but you also need to know how to do it. So James, he's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to people that don't know. He's speaking to people that are supposed to know. Notice how I said supposed to know. Because it, many times, even though we're supposed to know, we act like we don't. So James is speaking to those folks. We're going to go into the book of James chapter 4. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word, Father, is infallible. Your word is perfect. So, Father, right now, I diminish so that you may increase. Let no clever speech come out of my mouth, Lord. I repent for any sin that I have committed against you. I ask you, Lord, that you be with us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to go into the book of James chapter 4. And again, you, you always need to know, you always need to know who's the intended recipient. Like you need to know who's being spoken to. And James is speaking to believers and he's asking some questions. James 4.1 says, where do wars and fights or conflicts Come from among you. And you got to think about this. Why are there fights? Why are there fights? We know there are fights, but we never stop to think about why there are fights. People always say there's two sides to a story. And the are to a story, but it's only one truth. So James is asking a question. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Then he asks another question that gives you the answer to the first question. He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members. So James is saying... That what happens on the outside is a reflection of what's happening on the inside. So he's saying that you are fighting with you and therefore you fight with him. Think about any time. Any time if you're married, you know what I'm talking about, right? And those of you who are about to get married, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's, he has a side and then she has a side, but his side comes with baggage, and her side comes with baggage. So we have a problem. So James is saying that problem is because this problem was never fixed. So he's asking the question. He's saying, so, so where do conflict come from? And he's saying, it comes because you have conflict inside of you. Let's go to verse 2. So now he says, you lust and do not have. He doesn't say you want. That's a big difference. He doesn't say you'd like to. He's saying you lust. He's saying you covet. He's saying you want something more bad than you want God. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet. If, if you grew up in the hood, you're probably familiar with get rich or y'all, yes, okay. <laughs> Just so we know where we are. (laughs) 
But you understand the mentality. You understand the mindset. You understand where we come from. This is where we come from. You lust for that. You don't have it. You murder and covet and you still don't have it. Name one person that you know that did the wrong things but got the right results. Think about it. And we keep on going over the same cycle over and over and over again. We keep on doing the same things. And we keep on getting the same results. And that result is it's never good. So in essence, you broke the 10th commandment. You covered it. In essence, you also broke the 6th commandment. You shall not kill. Because you're either going to get it or you're going to die trying to get it. Then he says something interesting. He says, yet, yet, you do not have what what you want because you do not ask. So at this point, you kind of come into into, into like a, a, a conundrum, right? Because... He's saying, well, you covet, but yet you don't have because you don't ask. Can you go back to two, please? Because you don't have, because you don't ask. So now you get to a point that you're like, well, do I ask or do I not ask? What do I do? Have you ever found yourself in that position where like, wait, hold on, like, am I supposed? You don't want to put a foot wrong? Well, what he's saying here is, You're not praying. You're not praying. You're not praying. Now take me to three. He's saying, now you are praying. Before you weren't praying, now you are praying, but you don't get it. Now you are praying, but you don't receive. Because you ask amiss. So what he's saying is, first, you didn't pray. You don't ask. Now you do pray, but you're coming to God with your hand out. You're coming to God because you want God to do for you. You want God to give you instead of you giving to God. Your mindset's. It's not that of, God, I'm going to give you everything of me, and then your will be done, not mine. Instead, you're saying, God, bless me with fill in the blank. And you want to be blessed, but you not want to be blessed because of God. You don't want to be blessed for God. You don't want to be blessed for the kingdom. You want to be blessed for you. You want to bless a stunt on people. So he's saying, you ask amiss, that you may spend it. That you may spend it on your pleasures. So think about that. You're not praying, but then you pray and you still don't have because your motives are wrong. Have you ever found yourself in a situation? When you pray to God and you pray to God and you pray to God and you keep on praying, you pray some more and you keep on praying and you fast and you pray a little bit more and you keep on praying and the cycle is just going, 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 going. Everything is just going and you don't receive. You're praying and you don't receive. You're fasting and you don't receive. You're asking and you don't receive. What are your motives? What are your motives? Why are you asking the Lord for what you're asking the Lord for? Is it for self? Because you want to feel better? Or is it because you want to give glory to God? See, many times we receive and we forget about the one who gave us the blessing. Many times God gives you everything that you've been asking for. And then all you do is you turn around and you walk the other way. 
So James is saying, you, you ask and you don't receive because you're you asking amiss. You're asking for you. Many of us, we're, we want, we want for our family to come to Christ, not for them and their salvation, but for you and your sanity, but for you and your peace. Your motives are wrong. What could be higher? What could be higher than someone coming to Christ for their own salvation? What could be higher than that? And most of us, we just get to this point that it's all about me. James is saying, you ask. Yes, you ask. You pray. But you ask and miss. You ask him is because you want to spend it on your own pleasures. You're asking God for a house, why not me? Well, you ask it and miss. You're asking God for a business, well, you ask and miss, you're not going to get it. Because God will not give you something that you cannot handle. And the handling that I'm speaking about is you being able to move the kingdom forward with whatever's placed in your hand. There's no other reason. There's no other reason. And once you reach a level of spiritual maturity, you get to understand that God owns everything. And he doesn't owe you anything. But what he sees fit to give to you is because you did not ask him this. So what are you asking? What are you asking? Is it for selfish gain? Is it for me to look good? And what I'm not saying is that you shouldn't be okay. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that if God has not given it to you, you're not ready. So let's go to verse 4. Adulterers. And adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do you not know that not all gain is profitable for good? Do you not know that not everything that looks good to your eye is good for your heart? Do you not know that everything that's shiny isn't gold? Do you not know that everything that in the heart of a man seems good isn't good. Do you not know? So James is saying, if you want to be of the world, then you cannot be of God. You can't have both at the same time. He introduces something here that was very interesting to me because now, you being an adulterer or adulteresses against God. So, not only are you breaking the commandments against your spouse, but now you're doing it against God too. I learned one thing in my life. Whatever you're looking for, you're going to get. If you're looking for trouble, you're going to get trouble. If you're looking for good things, you're going to find good things. And he's saying, he's saying, if you want the stuff that the world gives, you're an enemy of God. And it's that simple. And I understand. I get it that as we grow up, we have a conscience, right? We have a moral compass. So I don't want that if I'm doing right, I don't want to go to hell. Except that doing right is not the address to heaven. Jesus Christ is the address to heaven. And we're so caught up on what we think is right that we don't read what's actually right. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world, he doesn't even say whoever is a friend of the world. He says whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or, 
do you think that the scripture says in vain? Now, this is sarcasm because nothing that's in scripture that God actually wrote, nothing that's in scripture is in vain. So he's saying, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? I was thinking about that. Because God is a jealous God. God, he wants an exclusive relationship. He does not want an open relationship. But we operate as though we're going to be with God today. We're going to be with somebody else tomorrow. So he's saying words weren't wasted when we said that God was a jealous God. So then he says, but he gives more grace. Tell somebody, he gives more grace. You got to say that like you mean it. He gives more grace. No, you got to say it for real. He gives more grace. Because it doesn't matter how long you go, he gives more grace. It doesn't matter how much you sin, he gives more grace. It doesn't matter what happens in your life, he gives more grace. It doesn't matter your mistakes. He gives more grace. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how low you go. It doesn't mean to go low. It, it, it means it doesn't matter how low you go. And your heart is in the right place. He gives more grace. I love that the Holy Spirit, he convicts us. If you're doing something wrong, if you're doing something wrong and you don't feel convicted, you better repent right away. If you're doing something wrong and you don't feel guilty, convicted, shameful, you better repent right away. Because the Holy Spirit convicts you. The Holy Spirit is the one that tells you, you shouldn't be doing this. The Holy Spirit is the one that directs you. Don't do that. When you do do that, and you don't feel like, oh my goodness, what did I just do? When you don't feel that, you better repent. And you better not wait for church service to repent. You better drop on your knees wherever you are and repent. Because the Holy Spirit gives you conviction. So if you don't get no conviction, you don't have the Holy Spirit. The Lord hates sin, and the more sin you do, the more you're alienating God from your life. More sin, less God. 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 You got to get to a point in your life that you, I, I know I'm not going to be sinless. I know that. What I do know is that when I do sin, I'm going to repent. He gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud. And, and this is why you got to read the, the, the word and, and really just get, get in deeper with, with the word because resist the proud here isn't just, eh. it's not that. It's I am going to go to battle with the proud. Against the proud. So if you don't understand that, then pride to you is an easy thing to do. And it is an easy thing to be. But, but the Bible is saying God is going to go to battle against the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. How humble are you? How humble are we? It takes humility to be able to repent. Because that means you don't have it all figured out. That means that you're not your own God. That means that you need God. That means that you know you sin against God. That means that you know you sin against yourself. That means that you know, you understand. And you're humble enough to be able to come and prostrate yourself before God. 
And you say, Lord, I messed up. Lord, forgive me. I messed up. I realize that the closer, the closer that we get to God, the less grace we actually need. Not because it isn't available, but because all, all, that, all that dark stuff that was in, it just keeps on coming out. See, I didn't care to come to the altar a thousand times. I really didn't because I needed my purification. I needed less bad and more God. I needed that. So when, when, when it was time to come to the front, I was running. I didn't care what you had to say about me. It's not my problem what you think of me anyway. I just, I want to know that I'm in good standing with God. So what I wanted to do is, Lord, please work with me. Please work in me. Purify my heart. Give me a new heart. Lord, take me out of this. I don't know how to do this. Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm suffering. Lord, I don't know what to do. And I came here because I needed God and not the other way around. So now we arrive to seven. And the Bible says, therefore, once you spoke about everything, once you broke some commandments, right? Once you did all that, once you coveted, once you killed, once you committed adultery, once you did all that, once you broke number one, once you did all that, therefore, 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 grace, therefore, grace, therefore, grace. Once you did all that, therefore, he says, submit to God. So when I read this, you got to think about this. What are you actually submitting to? Have you ever thought about that? This is a popular verse. Therefore, submit to God. What is submission to God? What are you submitting to? What is that? Because we read the Bible like, yeah, I'm going to submit to God. What are you submitting to? What are you submitting to? In our lives, a lot of things are arbitrary. And that means that I get to decide what I can and cannot do. So if submitting to God means something to Brother Mike and something else to Brother Joe, then I guess we're all, I mean, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. I'm going to submit to God however I want to submit to God. But let me ask you a question. If you don't know what it means to submit to God, how do you submit to him? If you don't know what the Bible is saying by submitting to God, how do you do it? Have you ever wondered how do I submit to God? Because it isn't coming to church on Wednesdays. It isn't coming to church on Fridays. It isn't coming to church on Sundays. I was in church and I was sinning. And no one knew it. And I was good. So coming to church is not submitting to God. What is submitting to God? He says, therefore... Submit to God. So then the question is, what is any other way to submit to God other than what James just said, which was the law of God? What kind of God would tell you, submit to me? I'm just not going to tell you what you got to do. What kind of God is going to tell you, hey, listen, you got to submit to me or you don't get into heaven. I just can't tell you what it is, what you got to do. Therefore, 
submit to God. As I was reading the word, I just got this example in my head, and, and I love cars, so every other analogy I gave is going to be about cars. Just get used to it. So if you're going on, on, on a road and the speed limit is 55, 55, what's the real speed limit? When you were saying, yes. So 85, somebody said 85? <laughs> Praise God. So normally, this is what I heard even in driver's head, that if you go 10 miles an hour, you might be all right. Now, what are the chances of me getting pulled over if I'm going 60 on a 55? I'm going 60 on a 55. What are the chances that I'm going to get pulled over? I, I, they're low, right? In fact, if an officer pulls me over, what am I going to say? I was only going five over. It was only, five. I'm going 60 to 55. Like, like, what you mean? And you know why we say that? Because we are arbitrary about the law. Because when it comes to that, we go 60 on a 55, and then we're entitled as though we're not supposed to get pulled over for breaking the law. So this causes two contradictions. Number one, we're saying that the speed limit really wasn't the speed limit. Because... If I'm okay, I was a 65, then 55 wasn't it. So that means that the law wasn't really the law. And then number two is that we believe that the officer, he shouldn't have pulled us over. Therefore, he shouldn't have enforced the law. We'd be surprised. I've never gotten pulled over for driving five, five over. But if I did, I promise you, if I did, I'm going to say, I'm going 60. This guy's going 85. Now, the problem is this. We operate in the spiritual realm the same way that we operate on the highway. See, the police officer, he is not my enemy. Therefore, when I'm going five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten over, he's okay. But the Bible teaches me that I do have an enemy. And that enemy is looking for me to go one mile over. One mile over because once they go one mile over, I'm going above speed limit. That's what this is saying here. Therefore, submit to the law of God. So now, let me ask you guys a question. I'm going to need your help. I'm going to ask you certain things about the Ten Commandments, and you guys tell me, am I over the limit? Can you guys do that? Okay. So what if I have other gods before God? Okay. What if I am making graven images? Just two? Amen. What if I take the name of God in vain? What if I don't keep the Sabbath? What if I don't honor my father and my mother? What if I kill somebody? What if I commit adultery? I heard my wife say that one. <laughs> what if I steal? What if I bear False witness. What if I covet? The enemy is just waiting for you to be over the limit. The enemy is just waiting for you to go over the limit. So that's why the Bible says submit to God so you don't go over the limit. And then he says resist the devil. Resist the devil. See, resist the devil here isn't the same as resist the devil two verses ago. 
two verses ago, it was, it was against. That was two verses ago. Now is for you to take a stand. Two verses ago, it was battle against. God is going to battle against. Here is stand. It's standing opposite of the devil. He's not telling you to go to war with the devil. He's telling you to stand against the devil, meaning the devil is there and I am here. The problem is that once I go over the limit, I'm not standing against the devil. Once I go over the limit, he's like, yes, God, yep, I got proof right here. He went over the limit. He went over the limit. He did it. He did it. He did it. He's over the limit right here. You didn't submit to God. You didn't submit to God. You went over the limit. And once you go over the limit, you don't have a chance because you're not standing against. You're standing with the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Before you resist the devil, the Bible tells you to do what? Submit to God. And then he will flee from you. Then we'll go to verse 8. He says, draw near to God. So you've been told to do two things. Two things. Before you draw near to God. See, the problem that we face is that we do things out of order. We want to draw near to God, but we don't want to abide by God's laws. We want the power, we don't want the discipline. We want the mandates. We want to be sent. We want to be ordained. We want all of that. What we don't want is a set of rules. He's like, God, give me the good, but don't give me the bad. Not understand that the law is not bad. The law is here to protect you. The law is here to give you freedom. But when everything is twisted, we don't want it. So we're told two things. We're told two things. We are supposed to submit to God. And then we're supposed to resist the enemy. And then, then you may draw near to God. When this is out of order, we want to draw near to God under our own arbitrary conditions. That's what we want. And then we wonder why God does not draw near to us. See, fasting won't help you. Praying won't help you if you won't submit. There's things in the Bible that, that even to give an offering, if, if, if I'm going to give an offering and him and I, we're not doing well, I'm suppo- even if he offended me, I'm supposed to go to him and say, my bad. And then I go bring my offering. Is that what the world tells you to do? That is never what the world tells you to do. So you either take that instruction or you take this instruction. Draw near to God and then he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. If there's no law, there's no sin. If there's no 55, I could go 60 and not have a problem. You need that to know where you're falling off. You need that to know why you're sinning. How can you wash your hands if you don't know your hands are dirty? So he says, wash your hands, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, because you don't know what's what. And he's saying, if you don't know, 
the order to approach God. Everything. Have you ever found yourself in a place you're just spinning your wheels? You go to church on Sunday. You go to church on Friday. You go to church on Wednesday. You just keep on going to church. You go to church. You go to church. You go to church. You go to church. Are you submitted to God? Are you, sub are you submissive to God? Let's go to verse 9. Lament and mourn and weep. When you realize how dirty you really are in the presence of an of a almighty God, I have no choice. That's why many times you, you come to the front and you, and you just start crying. You just start crying. And he's saying, that's what we're supposed to do. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Because I'm, I'm dirty in, in the face of God, in front of God. I'm this small. This is me. How are you coming to God? Are you coming to God as, as though he owes you something? Or are you being submissive to God? Go to verse 10. Humble yourselves. This is a call to repentance. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And when you humble yourself, when you repent, he will lift you up. When you come in lowly, he will make you greater. There's a lot of stuff happening in this world. There's a lot of stuff happening in this world. Everything is against you humbling yourself. There are movements in this world that are the complete opposite of humbling yourself. What's the opposite of being humble is being prideful. There's this movements of pride because pride in you is enmity with God. The Lord is calling us to repent. Turn from your wicked ways. You got to get to a point in your life that you say, I've tried it all. I've tried it all and, and nothing works. I've tried it all and nothing works. And you got to humble yourself and say, God, let your will be done and not mine. When you live your life like that, God can work with you. But when you don't, there's nothing God could do. What will you choose tonight? What will you choose tonight? The Lord has brought us to a place that we are studying the law. We want to be submissive to the law. We understand that the law is good. We understand that the law is of God. Elias, go to verse 7, please. So when the Bible says, therefore, submit to God, that's what this is referring to. Submitting to God is following his commandments. Submitting to God, to God is not going over the speed limit. Submitting to God is seeking God first and foremost. Submitting to God is not whining about a no. Submitting to God is doing the things that he asks us to do. Us to do. Submit to God, resist the devil. That's the order. After you do that, then, then you draw close to God, and then God draws close to you. As we close, the question tonight is, am I being submissive? The opposite of being submissive 
it should be rebellious. Am I being submissive to God? Everyone wants to get a word from God, but no one wants to read the word of God. Because everything that we need is in the word of God. We just won't read it. Because we want to get our ears tickled. And that's just not the order of God. I was in the same place for a very long time. But I looked like I wasn't. I was in the same place, but I looked like I wasn't. Because I was told I didn't have to submit to God. I was told that this, this was no longer good. This no longer existed. But when you read your Bible, what kind of God will tell you to submit to him without telling you what to submit to? I'm going to open up the altar. First and foremost... If you have not been submissive, if that hasn't been you, if you're just trying to do whatever you want to do, the altar's open. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, if you don't feel guilty for the stuff that you're doing, the altar's open. If you're not where you want to be in your walk, the altar is open. God is a good God. God is a good God. And when we do something wrong, we're able to come to him. Humbly come to him. We're able to access the God of gods, the king of kings. We're able to access him.